Thank you very much, and it's a great pleasure to be here again in the Stelios Philanthropic Foundations. I was here in uh, June last year, which is now um, eight, what is that, eight months ago, and at that time we were uh, one month into this round of talks, the Akinci uh, Anastasiades talks. So it was a time of um, uh, with a newborn faith in this process, uh, hope, um, uh, an emphasis of the opportunity that came out of the political change to lend to this new pair of leaders, Mr. Anastasiades, who was already there, uh, Kinshi, who was new, uh, and I think uh, everyone saw how that created a new dynamism and a new, uh, a new spirit uh, to the talks. I'm happy to share with you today that uh, eight months on from that meeting, which means nine months on from 15th of May, which was the day where they formally started negotiating, um, that spirit still prevails. Um, it is absolutely obvious to me that I am dealing with, on a very frequent basis, two leaders who want to solve the Cyprus problem and who want to be the leaders from the two communities who can make this happen. That has led to an enormous amount of work that's already done. Um, we just counted, just to give a numerical example, the two leaders have met in the formal setting of negotiators 25 times. They, of course, met many other times as well, but that not counting the real formal settings. They are excellent negotiators. Uh, Andreas Mavriamis and uh, Özdil Nami have met uh, formally 95 times uh, so far. And 95 times that on nine months, that means that's quite a lot of uh, days a week. And they spend full days working with each other and with my team, with me when I'm here. Uh, and in the meantime, they prepare and, and lead all the other work. So there's an enormous effort. Now, numerically, it's not that relevant. It's just to illustrate the effort there. But I would like to highlight here that beyond the people you see on television and so on, there are several hundred people in uh, almost 30 working groups or technical committees of different sorts, of all sorts of issues. Uh, hundreds of people who, who have met hundreds of times, if you combine all of these, working on all the different aspects of the Cyprus um, uh, uh, solution, of the Cyprus settlement. And this process, as any process, it had, had uh, uh, better days and uh, not so good days maybe, but there hasn't really been any crisis of the talks, and that's remarkable. Uh, I have actually, I cannot really think of a comparable process where you have nine months of continuous progress in the right direction. I'm not saying that in order to suggest that a solution is just around the corner. I'm quite frequently criticized for being too optimistic. And as a lot of newspapers have made a big deal of my, uh, my um, very, this very negative uh, element that I'm too optimistic about this. I'm not too optimistic. I'm realistically optimistic. But I also want to be very clear in saying we still have work to do. It's not just around the corner. And I will defend that as a good thing, because we have, or you have, the Cypriots, the leaders, the negotiators, all the people who work with them. After all, and reflect on that, has the benefit of taking the time to get it right, to get this properly done. We should not waste time. Um, and this is something we speak about, and by the way, where the leaders completely agree. Um, we do not want to lose time, to waste time, but we want to use time in order to make sure that we do not only have a paper that can be signed and presented to a referendum, we do not even only want to help the leaders to have a deal that can get two yeses in the referendum. We want something that works. And we want something that works in all its aspects, that there is not a, uh, something we forgot about, something that was hidden inside, a, let's say, a pseudo agreement, which seems good on paper, but doesn't work in reality. So that's why I will want to share with you, this is moving, continuing to move in a positive, constructive direction. But uh, there's still work to do, and it's quite logical, and actually on this front quite normal in, uh, as negotiations go, that in the early days, 
you will focus on low hanging fruits. So you will get the impression that things move fast because you're after all dealing with things that have been talked about, negotiated before, and where you were not that far away from an agreement on certain chapters, certain elements. So with goodwill and some creativity, you can kind of fill out the, the missing the blanks. Um, what in a sense has been much more important is venturing into areas that have hardly ever been covered in the proper way, and particularly not in the way that they're covered now. That is more cumbersome, but in many ways also more important. And it, while I'm sure, I'm happy to take questions, and you can ask any question you like, but I will not, neither in my speech nor afterwards, reveal sort of exactly where we are, what are we doing right now, because that's the job of your elected leaders. It's not my job, and I want to be loyal to that. They decide. And they are free to choose and decide how much and how little they want to say. And it's not my job to sort of uh, say, oh, but I'll tell you the real truth, what we did yesterday, what we'll do tomorrow. I will not do that. So I'll talk about the broader, uh, the broader context in which this is happening. But I have one thing uh, which I wanted to emphasize particularly, and maybe since we're here in the, uh, in the Stelios Philanthropic uh, Foundation, but also because um, you will have an award ceremony, uh, again, uh, re uh, rewarding um, uh, entrepreneurs and people you know, showing initiative. There's something very attractive about that, because there's one thing I know about entrepreneurs that are successful. They see opportunities, not problem. There's all kinds of entrepreneurs, but there's no entrepreneur who starts by saying, this will not work. But then you may as well don't, not try, and I'm sure you will not get, I'm, I'm not in the committee, but I'm sure if, you, if your starting point is that I have an idea, I'm definitely convinced it's not going to work. It's unlikely, I think, I think fair to say that you will get the award. So we're talking about people who see opportunity over problems, who see future over past. And that's, I think, something that is very important in the Cyprus problem, because as some of you heard me speak about this before, and what I'm saying now is an observation, uh, empathic, observation uh, of something which I fully identify with because I totally understand it uh, given where uh, where uh, the communities in Cyprus both come from which is that the past is difficult the present is always also difficult future is actually easier and every time in almost any context normal people in the street different groups I meet up to leaders level when you actually are able to speak about the future, as the future, we find solutions. Or at least it's possible to see solutions. I'm not saying finding agreement. And but if you if if the discussion about the future is infused by past, it's more difficult. Um, and that is what I'm saying here is not that I believe any society neither can nor should forget the past. You actually do need to understand your past, but also the past of other people and what is the shared past and what is the divisive past. But if, but if the past becomes the enemy of moving forward, you will have a problem. And in any conflict society, violent or not, but any society with a kind of conflictual identity, that is a perennial problem, that the past keeps holding people back from moving forward to the future. I'm just trying to connect that to the idea of entrepreneurs on a practical level by communal or whatever, uh, looking at what can actually be done, how can we change things, how can we achieve something by focusing on something which is future-oriented. We put a lot of emphasis in our work on um, what we broadly can call the economic aspects of a settlement. And I have got one main thing I wanted to share with you today, and I think this is the right group in the right context. I really would think it would be helpful if people start stop talking about the so-called cost of a solution. The whole idea of the cost of a solution is a misconception, a fundamental misconception. What is costly is the non-solution. What costs money is the all the opportunity cost, all the money that's lost because of division. That's costly. That's every investment that does not happen because of the um, geopolitical risk, and I know in a lot of wars, well, uh, outside of Cyprus, say Cyprus would have been interesting, but isn't it, isn't it divided? Isn't there something about Greeks and Turks and the neighborhood and problems and non-recognition, whatever it is? Let's go somewhere else. That's costly. It's all the, you know, all the 
the shipping industry that could have you know been based here and be the, the main regional trade link to everywhere but had to flag out because you know you can't go to Turkish ports. It's the um, it's the young people that leave the island because they don't really see as much future opportunity that maybe the entrepreneurs that will win the price sees. That's cost, that's sort of lost productivity. Um, it's, it's the trade that you're not having. It's, you know, it's the parts of the island that cannot properly trade with the European market, other parts of the island which cannot properly trade with you know, neighboring markets in, in plural, in, in the neighborhood. This is cost. Solution is opportunity. Solution brings money to the island. That said, of course it's true that you need an upfront investment to get over the initial hurdle. So yes, there's money involved, but, but solid evidence, and more and more evidence is coming out of the work that's been done by uh, economists from Cyprus and international economists, that the solution over time will pay for itself. And what it actually means is that for all these reasons and many other reasons, uh, agglomeration effect, uh, economy of scale, uh, effectiveness in general, all these effects combined, will, uh, it's, it's very likely to create a, a growth uh, trajectory which is significantly higher than that of divided, the two divided communities. And in, in a relatively short number of years, there will actually be more extra growth than the so-called cost. So could we please stop talking about the cost of a solution if it's, it's a problem to solve, uh, not as, as if solving the problem is a problem. Solving the problem is good uh, for at least, I mean, I think in many respects, but definitely in a very material form for the economy of Cyprus. And, and money is, of course, for everyone. And we're talking about this is jobs, job opportunities for young people, young people staying rather than leaving, believing uh, in, in the future. In that concept, I'm extremely happy about the two leaders, um, Sassiades and Akinci, who very early on in this process took the initiative to authorize me and my office to work with the um, with with the um, uh, international financial institutions, with uh, with the World Bank, the International Monetary Fund, with also with the European Commission, the European Central Bank, and what I can tell you, which we should all I think we should all be rejoicing, is that the, the level of engagement from these international institutions is unprecedented anywhere. It's of course unprecedented in Cyprus. Never happened before at this level, and and, and this is very constructive work. This is work supporting a leader-led process. They're not coming here to tell us what to do or to tell the Cypriot what to do. They're coming here with advice as solicited by leaders. They're coming with the advice they're asked to give. And they send some of the best people because they believe this is a very unique opportunity in the world to get these things right. And, and it's only unprecedented in Cypriot history, I know that for a fact, but it's actually rather unprecedented globally to have that level of support and attention. That's something that should be noted. It's major and it's very, very uh, significant. As you know, um, the goal of the talks is already well known. Basically, what they're seeking, what the leaders are seeking, is a bicommunal, bicommunal federation uh, with uh, full respect of the, uh, of the principles of which the EU is built and all these words that you know from the which are very essential, which we remind ourselves about every day. But I really want to convey a couple of extremely important observations. We are negotiating a genuine federation. We're not negotiating a confederation, a weak confederation of two de facto states uh, under the formal auspices of some kind of federation. And not because one side has been forced to do this, but because the current political leadership on both sides wants exactly that. That's their starting point, that's what they want to see, which means one single sovereignty to the world, it's one state, yes, constituent states, as Germany has Lender, or as the United States of America has many states, but there's one country, Cyprus, one country with one economy, with, one, with citizens who are citizens of whatever it will be called, I will not mention the name, because that's again a topic for, it. but it will probably include the word federal, and it's also likely to would unite all. Anyway, so it's a, uh, 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 and it will end by Cyprus, and I think for every, for daily use, you will all want to call it Cyprus anyway. I'm actually living in a country called Confederazione Helvetica. Most of you don't know that because you call it Switzerland. Uh, so, you know, the, the one thing is the formal name, and the other thing is what you actually call it. Which is, by the way, not the Confederation, but the Federation. 
but has used its own name confederation. It's confusing for but that's beside the point. Um, um, very important, and I think the, these are things I really want really want to to to, to highlight today. This this um, you know economic aspect, but but that's just one thing. Um, so it's real federation. The other one is uh, a real uh, it's it's a real European country. So what we want to do is that this federal bicameral bicameral federation with a highlight on federation is going to be. Uh, 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 sort of fully embedded in the European Union in all that entails, which means a key, uh, your uh, European key will be rolled out all over the country, and that's already happening. There is a significant effort from that, of course, already happened in the Greek Cypriot part in the Republic of Cyprus, but there is a significant effort going on right now where the future Turkish Cypriot constituent state, to be very precise there, the future Turkish Cypriot constituent state. Is preparing, is being prepared for everything that comes with European acquis. And the people who contribute to that are the Turkish Cypriot themselves, assistance of the, of the Greek Cypriot, of course, the European Union institutions, but also uh, World Bank and other organizations working on that. That's not a small thing. And these things take time anywhere. Remember, when a country becomes an EU member, well, the, the Greek Cypriots in the audience remember that from when the Republic, these things are, they're not necessarily controversial, but it's a lot of work. It's a lot of work to get things right. For instance, you need, you know, some of them are highly practical things like phytosanitary regulations. Sounds boring, but that's why I can be sure that when you, or almost certain at least, that when you buy food from another European country, it is up to the standards that you expect. So you can have a food market, right? Because if you're not really certain about that, you would probably try to stick to your own food and not buy anybody else. Food. But how do you get there? Well, you have certain standards for how you do uh, how you do food production and how you do you know how a slaughterhouse is you know built and you know so all all these different things have to be implemented either on day one or at a defined time after a transition period. This work is happening and it takes a lot of effort and a lot of people are involved in it and it's moving forward. But it's one of the examples where I say obviously uh, still quite some work um, uh, to do. Um, one of the last, most recent initiatives uh, in this area of, uh, um, uh, of uh, committees and uh, the working groups and technical committees is the work that was started on education. And I would also very much in the spirit of this place uh, underline that I very much agree uh, that the leaders, uh, that probably should have happened a long time ago, but it's happening now. Uh, I attended the first meeting of this group uh, excellent people from both sides, really dedicated to think how can we prepare, prepare for a future uh, sort of common, shared uh, educational uh, system. Um, and this is very important in the context both of pre preparing for the future, but also in the aspect of reconciliation. And one of the things I, you know, people ask, uh, so when when will we have a deal? When do you think there will be a deal? And I have no other. Uh, and you will probably ask again. And feel free to ask. I'll tell you what the answer is. I don't know. I, but I have heard the leaders say to me, to my team, to each other, and to the public that they believe in a leader in 2000. They believe in a solution. The leaders believe in a solution in 2016. Now I think that's fair. I, I I think that's a fair assessment from the leaders. But I defer to them because they are there to make that final decision. It's not really my main point when it happens. I think my, I'm here to be helpful. We have a good team of people from the UN, from, from uh, other international organizations trying to help, and we have a lot of Cypriots engaged. The leaders have to feel politically, and they have to sort of feel that they are there in order to find the right moment to conclude this. But this is what they are saying, and they keep saying it from the Christmas message that you may have seen on YouTube uh, to appearances abroad, appearances here in the Irish community <coughs> this year. It, well, my message is that's possible. That's possible with the trust, will and leadership that the leaders provide, that is possible. I would turn the question on, on the head rather than saying when do we have a deal. I would say if I were, you know, if I was a super uh, uh, not in the negotiating team, but watching this or involved in some other ways, are we ready for that? Are we ready? You know, are we, are we actually prepared for the fact that maybe one day 
between you know now and the end of this year, which is not that. I mean, we're we're late March. I mean, it's nine months. Are we actually ready for what it's going to mean for us? It has to work on the situation. Are we ready to reap the benefits? Are we ready to make the you know the right uh, decisions? Rather than saying is it taking much time, turn it on the head and say you know are we actually oh this is happening. That's you. I mean, it used to not be happening. So over all these years, we thought it wouldn't happen, and suddenly it may actually be happening. Are we ready for that? And what follows from that? And my concluding point now, because I don't want to speak all the time. I want to listen to you, and you don't have to come question. You can come and comment or whatever. Is I think it's incredibly important that civil society broadly defined, be that you know women's group or youth groups or elderly or people who are fled from somewhere to somewhere else, or religious leaders, or non-religious, whatever it is, civil society actually asks themselves that question and see what is my role in this. I, I'm not the one to answer that. I'm not super. I don't have a vote. I have a little bit of influence because I'm chairing the talks. But I, when you have a referendum, uh, you need to be a citizen of you know, uh, Cyprus uh, and, you have, and the two communities will have a referendum. And, Almost everybody in this room will have one vote. I don't. That's your decision what's going to happen at that time. But the question is, what would we do if that happened? And what should we do now in order to prepare for that new reality? Which I think is a remarkably fascinating thing, but also a big thing to reflect on and think about and deal with. I think I'll stop there and just say, uh, great to be here again. Great to see you, uh, old friends, new friends. Um, and uh, more than willing to have an exchange with those who would like to say something to me or ask a question.